As Neil descends the ladder to step onto the moon, the grandest achievement in all of mankind's history, mere moments away, Buzz is filming from the Lem window. And gall darn it, the lighting is just horrid. No worries, mate, just add more light so we can all see Neil even better. Hmm, it's still a little dark. Let's add some more. Never mind Neil is completely in the shadow of the lamb, and we're told the sun provided the only light during the moon missions, but clearly you can see Neil is being lit up from a second, maybe even a third source of light. Even those of you who are thinking Buzz was opening the had the ability to open the aperture of the camera, well, how would he know that without Houston telling him? Neil is talking to Houston at this time, and we're all waiting for Neil to utter those famous words. Yet there's never any mention of, in any official NASA transcripts of the need to adjust the lighting. Anyone who knows anything about the moon landings knows that the two astronauts climbed out of the LEM and then proceeded to deploy the U.S. flag together. It was ceremonial. And it was well documented that that was the process, mission after mission. Well, funny thing, here's the picture we're told Neil took as Buzz began to descend the ladder for his very first time to step on the moon. And wouldn't you know it, if you look closely at the LEM window here, you can see something very familiar in the window's reflection. Can't quite see it? No problem, let me increase the gamma brightness here so you can make it out better. And these two images clearly show that the flag has been deployed. However, Buzz has not come down the ladder at this point, and the video shows that both astronauts place the flag together. Multiple takes to do each scene are very present throughout the photographic record of Apollo. More on multiple takes involving the flag later in this episode. Back to Buzz, here's a shot Neil took of him as he continued to descend the ladder. Zoom in on the photo and something very peculiar will jump off the screen at you. One of the stagehands forgot to attach Buzz's glove to his suit. You can see the red ring where the glove is supposed to attach to the gauntlet of the suit. A close look at Buzz's gloves as he comes down the ladder, a matching pair with a dark rubberized coating and a very distinctive <laughs> Nvidia sheen, quote unquote. On the right are the gloves for the famous photo of Man on the Moon. Lighter, not matching, and no shimmer, even in direct sunlight. Buzz cannot change gloves in the vacuum of space and a second pair were not supplied with their spacesuits. At the top is an image of the glove and how it connects to the base of the gauntlet. However, as Buzz comes down the ladder, the red ring is visible that connects the glove and the suit. The gloves are clearly not connected to the suit, perhaps to help keep them cool during the simulated filming. Here are a couple of additional photos to show you how high up the glove attaches to the suit. I bet Buzz's arm sure got cold there in the freezing vacuum of space. Apollo 11 showing assorted items, rocks, and car parts under the lem. Take note of these items along the shadow line on the left here. On the photo on the right, the shadow does not have anything on the ground. The set obviously has been redressed for the next photo shoot. The landing drogue has been straightened as well. To really provide some damaging evidence that multiple scene takes were conducted to get it right before the world was shown all of this footage, Take a look at the footage provided to us by NASA after Neil and Buzz had ascended the ladder back into the LEM for the final time. 
Notice first, real quickly, the date here on the color plate, July 11, 1969. You NASA fans surely know the official dates of the Apollo 11 mission, right? Well, if not, here you go. Okay, as this version of Neil and Buzz shows, they left the flag pointing almost straight at the sun and then climbed into the limb, launched from the surface, never to touch the moon again. But in this video, there's a different version of the same events. I want to point out a few things. First, check out the double shadow from the limb, indicating multiple light sources. Strike one. And then as the camera pans to the right to reveal the flag, take a note of which direction the flag now is pointing. Strike two. Now the camera will pan back to the left and you'll see the double shadow again, but then they cut the video and start again and this time the double shadow has been eliminated. Strike three. Again, keep in mind that Neil and Buzz did not get back out after ascending into the LEM, getting ready to launch and rendezvous with the command module. That's three strikes, NASA, and you're out. In 2015, NASA released more than 8,400 high-resolution images on Flickr, claiming it was every photo taken by the astronauts during the six moon missions from 1969 to 1972. What you are about to see is the result of more than 10,000 hours of research pouring over every photo, every video, every mission log, everything available online relating to NASA's alleged six lunar landings. The tireless researcher's name is Mr. Scott Henderson, and he's been gracious enough to share his findings with us all. Before we begin, if you already question whether the moon landings actually took place, this and the subsequent videos will be the nail in the coffin. If, however, you believe the moon missions did take place, just like we've all been told, this video series is going to significantly shake your confidence in that belief. Mr. Hennison has created plates of photos and diagrams and included his commentary to go along with each, which I will read. So let's begin. We'll start with one of the most if not the most damaging evidence that the moon missions were not shot on the moon, but right here on Earth. This is a close-up of the Apollo 17 flag. We've all been told that there's no atmosphere on the moon, and therefore there could not be any moisture, right? Then why is the flag wet? You can see it is drying from the edges in. Additional photos in this series will reveal other areas of moisture and even standing water. The Apollo 11 LEM is on the left side, and the Apollo 15 version on the right. The helium tank has been removed, not repositioned, to accommodate the rover on the descent stage of the LEM. The helium tank was used to pressurize the fuel to deliver it to the descent engine. Without the helium tank, the engine will not run. And any change in equipment would require the entire machine to be rebalanced as well. A display model or prop for a, st for a stage set can easily be modified to fit the needs of the filming being done. Further, there is no evidence that the engine has been fired in any of the videos or pictures. The lack of visible exhaust or heat waves, crater or scorching the paint on the exhaust bell housing, as well as the lack of moon dirt on the foot pads, is the same for all six of the missions. And where the descent stage has a helium tank or not, makes no difference. Where the engine is capable of running or not, makes no difference. Apollo 16 Cuff Checklist the checklists are prepared months before launch, however, the information contained in them is impossible for NASA to know in advance. How could NASA know the size, shape, exact location of a rock, exact time the astronauts would arrive at it, the camera settings, position of the sun, where the footprints and the disturbed area would be located? How could NASA know the mineral composition of the inside of a rock before it is split open? On the lower left, ALSEP photos taken, past tense. The checklists are storyboards and cue cards used for filming the scenes. The astronauts, when wearing the suits, could not hear instructions from the film crew, 
and the helmets would restrict their vision, so the cuff checklists were used in Apollo 12 to 17. Apollo 11 did not have these lists. Apollo 17 checklist contains impossible details, locating four craters to drive through and around. This is a very well staged scene. One astronaut operating two cameras and taking photos at the same time. Jones is the inspector for the filming, and his location of where he is standing is clearly marked. So what is he doing on the moon? Well, they had to make sure Jones wasn't in the shot. It's a director's note. Jones was the inspector of the simulation video shot weeks before takeoff, and this is the same video that NASA claims was taken on the moon. This is the plate at the start of the video showing the date it was shot, November 28th, 1972. And of course, Jones was never a crew member. Note the dates of the Apollo 17 mission, however. December 7th through 19, 1972. But the video was shot November 28th of them on the moon, more than a week earlier. In our next video, Mr. Henderson shows evidence that the Apollo 15 LEM was dropped during the videoing of its landing and damaged significantly. We'll cover the repairs required before the astronauts could be filmed next to the LEM. The Apollo 15 LEM was dropped during the videoing of its landing and, and damaged significantly. I've slowed down the video here so you can see the damage the LEM suffers because of this stage mishap. Two damaged PLSs lie on the ground, but only two were supplied for the mission, according to NASA. So by simple deduction here, the astronaut taking the picture undoubtedly must have one on, and the astronaut in the background must also have one on. So in actuality, I guess there were four on Apollo 15. The main strut is not centered on the landing pad as a result of the crash landing and you can see the ball joint has been broken. Secondary struts were broken off. The ball swivel joints had to be replaced. Photographs could not be taken outside of the LEM until the damage was repaired. To avoid this, an SEVA and two EVAs were done before the flag and photos around the LEM were shown. There were no shots or video of the first steps of the Apollo 15 astronauts on the lunar surface. The photos here are almost shot at the same angle, showing the damage to the exhaust housing that happened as a result of the crash of Apollo 15 on the left. However, the photo on the right is from Apollo 17. It is the same equipment, and the damage has not been repaired. Only the Apollo 15 legs were worked on to lift it off the ground. Okay, back to the PLSSs. You can see the cover is removed. The only function it had was to cool the suit, just the sublimator canisters. On the left is a display model of what should be inside the PLSS. The arrows are pointing to the top, core, and the canister. When the Apollo 15 LEM was dropped during the simulated landing, equipment was damaged and the rover was broken from its mounts. The exhaust housing was crushed, as you can see here. The lowering arms for the rover are broken on the ground, and all of the ropes are broken. The rover was damaged as well, as we'll see clearly in the next episode in this series. Note the mold growing on the sewage bag, another example of equipment being recycled for each mission and aging over time. On the lower right of this photo is more damage and broken parts. The pink foam above the legs on the flat surface between the descent and ascent modules. The astronauts in their moon suits did not have the ability to get to that location. 
and considering that the astronauts have, been, have not been anywhere near the LAM since landing, riding around on the rover for two EVAs, the activity under and around the LAM was caused by repair crews, not them. They quickly raked the soil to cover the footprints, and broken parts were thrown under the LAM, not even removed from the set. Here again is a close-up of the Apollo 17 flag drying from the edges in, a stark reminder that the Apollo missions were shot right here on Earth, not the lunar surface, in which no moisture could ever be present based on how the moon is presented to us by NASA. You'll continue to see as you make your way through these Apollo videos that the evidence is there on how the equipment and the props were recycled mission after mission on the moon stage set and shot over a period of time that resulted in the obvious aging, weathering, and breaking down of many items. So let's proceed. These are the three Apollo 17 rovers. That's right, three different rovers in Apollo 17. Look closely at the right rear fender which identifies the differences in each. The seat and floor have tools and replacement parts that were not on board the LEM. The payload specialist's main function was to reduce the weight of the vehicle, even counting every stitch in their suits to bring the weight down. There was no contingency for repairs. As a result of the crash landing in Apollo 15, which we covered in our previous episode, the rover was damaged. Note the painted rims and the damage to the rear fender. The missing fender and painted rims here. The fender has fallen off of the rover in Apollo 16 on the left. Nothing was done to fix it between the two mission filmings, so the astronauts mounted a map to the fender in Apollo 17 to stop the dirt from flying up at them. This is just another example of the same equipment being used for all of the missions. The Apollo 15 rover has broken down. In Apollo 16, the front steering rods have fallen down. The astronauts drove the rover backwards, as can be seen in magazine 117, from 18733 for the next 70 or more pictures. The direction of the tire tread shows that clearly. The video of this traverse shows the rover moving forward, however, that means NASA has presented the video to us in reverse. They're playing it backwards. The same rover from Apollo 15 was used in Apollo 16. The front steering broke and the only way to drive it was backwards, so the wheels castered like a shopping cart. The tire tracks confirm the direction. If they were driving back over their own tracks, the pattern would be the opposite of what is shown. Apollo 15, 16, and 17, the same rover was used. One of the features that identifies this is the oil leak in the rear axle on the left side. The LEM was dropped, remember, during the simulated landing, damaging the rover in Apollo 15. The fenders and steering are the most notable. This rover continued to have problems and breakdowns during filming. Apollo 16 has two rovers and Apollo 17 apparently had three. They can be identified by comparing the frame rails and tire tracks. This is the second rover in Apollo 16, used only for this photo shoot, the Jump Salute. It is distinctive and is the only rover to have the front left fender with a double rib. All other pictures of a rover from all the missions have a single rib, like the front right fender. The upper images are of the lower frame rails of the Apollo 17 rovers. All are very different in design, just in front of the right rear wheel. Three different tire tracks found in Apollo 17. While waiting for Aldrin to come down the ladder, Armstrong took this photo. On the top right is an air intake louver, and on the bottom is an air intake housing, where an air filter goes. The center bolt and washer is visible, and it has a handle on the intake horn 
as well. The objects on the ground are automotive in nature. Looking at the mesh of material behind Aldrin, I am surprised that they didn't trip and fall. On the bottom right, there is a car alternator, and below, some bent metal parts. The surveyor is a quickly put together prop. The solar array is just a wooden board, and they are not even the same. In the lower right shows standing water, and the coating is peeling back. NASA wants you to believe that this thing navigated to the moon, descended, landed, and sent back pictures, scooped up dirt, analyzed it, and sent back data. If so, where's the high gain antenna? NASA's Genesis rock location. It appears the interior of one rock was soft enough to be kicked apart with a boot. Inside the rock were metal parts. This broken rock revealed two spark plugs, a champion left and an AC Delco right. Any motor mechanic would recognize them. As discussed in our previous episode, the rover broke down. The front steering arms were left on the ground, and beside it is a golf ball. But Apollo 14 was the only mission that claimed to feature golf balls. And this is not the only ball in Apollo 17. On close examination, there are many other golf balls present in this photo. The only reflection from the CSM should be the blackness of space. This indoor simulation of the CSM is for dramatic effect showing the moon. However, the CSM was never in a lower orbit before the LEM. Two doors are clearly visible and on the right there are three men in the reflection. Two are facing to the left and the other is facing the camera. Lighting inconsistencies are apparent as well. The EVA suits worn by the astronauts had a sunglasses pocket. All six missions had the same pocket. It is however impossible to put sunglasses on during an EVA in the vacuum of space. NASA had payload specialists to reduce the weight and NASA claims that they were so detailed that every stitch in their suits were counted to reduce the payload as much as possible. However, if you were faking it here on Earth, sunglasses would come in handy after taking off a helmet with a gold sunscreen and the visor. The astronauts were superstars and had to look as cool as James Dean. The crews must have started working early in the morning and then had to wait for the mist to clear. The astronauts were kind enough to take a couple of photos to record the event. The result of wet lunar dust. In the image on the left, astronaut Cernan has picked up a little dust turned mud and some of it has got onto his spacesuit, especially the left arm and the glove of his suit. In the right photo, just two frames later, the wet lunar soil has been washed off on the moon. To confirm this, the suit is still visibly wet on his left arm and glove. NASA claims this photo was taken in space during an undocking procedure. It is clear to see, however, that water is drying from this panel. This window was blown out during a pressure test. It was taped back in and a rain guard, broken in this photo, was installed to try and keep the water out. 
NASA claims this was taken halfway to the moon. Water is running down the window in zero gravity, and water is in between the layers of glass, which means the seal is broken. And water does not freeze on the glass, even though it's minus 250 degrees outside. Note that the water is causing the paint to peel between the layers of glass. All set removal from the lamp. The poor condition of this piece of equipment is unmistakable. It appears to have been exposed to water, resulting in mold growth, and consequently is very badly soiled. Remember, the equipment, we were told, was prepared under ultra-clean conditions before the mission. The deterioration of this item must be intentional to draw attention to the simulation. These two photos are examples of equipment left outside to weather. NASA is using the same props until it is in such bad shape that it has to be replaced. All of the experimental package ages over time from mission to the next. On the left is standing water and mud that is left after water has evaporated. On the right, cracks are visible and the plastic is curling up. In our next episode, Mr. Henderson and I will present photographic evidence that, says that the stage crew intentionally left clues for all of us to find later as they became more and more frustrated with their role in the greatest hoax ever pulled on the world. So stay tuned. Oh, and one more thing. When filming a fake moon landing, make sure when you are making observations that you appear to be enthusiastic. Just like this cuff checklist says. These two rocks were on the left side of the large rock, Tracy's Rock. Then in magazine 146, the rocks are on the right, and one photo later are missing altogether. This shows how NASA can manipulate a set. The ground on the left side of the rock has been brought back into pristine condition after the rocks were moved. Speaking of rocks, this is an example of how some of the rocks were made for the moon set. One of the features this rock has is its color, unlike the other rocks in the photos. The wire mesh is covered with a plaster type coating. It didn't turn out well for NASA, so there's only a few of these rocks. And only in Apollo 15 do the rocks look like this. The prop rock exteriors were coated to make them appear to be real rocks. This rock was turned over to reveal how it was formed. It appears to have a lunar dust coating. The dust can be scraped away as pointed out here with the tool. A real rock would need to be split open to reveal a flat surface. Examples of how rocks were produced for the set. Remember, the many automotive parts in our previous videos? They look like real rocks, but objects such as automotive parts may be found inside. The one above appears to be like an ignition coil. Note the steel band, A, wrapped around the case with square nuts, B, facing the camera. This very distinctive rock has been used in more than one mission indicating that the same location was used to stage the Apollo moon landings. If you don't immediately recognize the distinctive folds on the corners of this rock, it's the prop C rock found in Apollo 16. Penn and Teller addressed this prop rock on one of their TV shows. No surprise, then, that it has magically reappeared in an earlier Apollo mission photograph. Perhaps we can see now why the image creators drew attention to it. GC. NASA has tried to get rid of the C prop rock, but it's not the only one with lettering on it. This bag is from a golf course. The GC on the bottom means that this is a rental golf bag. Perhaps Major Tom was using it on the moon, and then the GC would stand for ground control. 
This one will open Nas's eyes and hope their eyelashes don't start falling out. The grasping tongs are carefully placed so the shadow makes an arrow. The white glove with rubber tips is at the end of the arrow. To the left of that glove are many more gloves with the fingers sticking straight out of this dirt pile. The astronauts must have had fun staging this. Easily taken to be a small rock in the background, this close-up reveals it contains what appears to be an upper part of a half-buried Labatt beer can. This Canadian Labatt label design is a very close match to the one in the 1970s photo. The LEM landing gear were built by Hero Aerospace of Quebec, Canada. The crews that worked on building and dressing these sets really were whistleblowers. A double shadow of this size would have to take some very powerful studio lighting from two light sources. Alternatively, these images have been retouched. It is better to have it in writing than to swear in a Bible. This BS statement is from the disgruntled employees of the Apollo 12 stage crew. We've all written in the sand or dirt before, right? In case you weren't aware, the back panels of the ascent stage were nearly blown off when the explosive bolts were set off that were meant to separate the Apollo 16 ascent stage from the descent stage as seen here in this official NASA footage of the liftoff from the moon surface. Watch closely and you can see the back panels rippling like pieces of fabric as the ascent stage rose out of sight. Here is the same video, slowed down, so you can really see the panels rippling as they are nearly blown off. And finally, here is that same video again, slowed down and magnified. NASA didn't hide this fact either. Here are two photos allegedly snapped by Command Module Pilot Thomas K. Mattingly II as the ascent stage prepared to rendezvous with the CSM. Clearly the blast, if strong enough to nearly blow the panels completely off the side of the spacecraft, would have disabled the craft if it were a real takeoff. This fact alone provides damaging evidence that it was simply a staged event and the ascent stage was lifted by cables as there is no exhaust, just the explosive bolts going off and the side of the spacecraft being blown out. Further, there were no comments from either NASA nor the two astronauts, John Young and Charles Duke, about the explosion. They were just reading from the script. Here is the audio from the official NASA video and the mission transcript itself. What a, what a ride, what a ride. The LEM, we are told, was a very thin-skinned, lightweight machine. If it encountered any kind of explosion, especially one of this magnitude, it would have caused a rupture of the hull in the vacuum of space and resulted in a catastrophic failure. What is behind those panels, you may ask? Well, here's a photo of the lander taken prior to the mission here on Earth to show all the wiring, electrical components, and mission-critical mechanisms located directly behind the panels that were subject to this explosion. In this photo of the Apollo 16 LEM taken by one of the astronauts before liftoff, you can see the explosive pack behind the panels when magnified. This is further illustrated when you compare the Apollo 17 panels to that of the Apollo 16 version. It's clear the panels were either replaced or simply reused again after a fresh coat of paint had been applied to the ones that were nearly blown off. As we've demonstrated throughout this Apollo series, 
Equipment was reused and recycled mission after mission on the moon stage set. <laughs>